Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Crossover. Starring Josh Johnson and Chris McGill. Featuring Christina Thorson. And of course, you, the Instagram live chat. Now, sit back and enjoy this week's edition of The Crossover. Powered by Card Ladder. Black screen? No, we're good. Oh, what was it like doing the whole show with the black screen? Uh, it was weird. Like when I first joined just now, it went black for like a second, and I was like, oh gosh, and then it I popped up. I saw it on your face. I saw the black screen look come across your face, but we're good. Yeah, we're good. <clears throat> nice. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the crossover. It's uh, Friday, May 17th, and... And it's uh, Dallas Card Show weekend. Yes. Haven't been out there yet, but I think we're going to go out there tomorrow. And it's starting to get hot. It is starting to get hot in Dallas. This is it hot in uh, the Phoenix area? Yes. It was 100 today. <laughs> How do you, uh, what do you do for your running when it's that hot? Uh, I wake up at 5, 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> well, I learned a Valuable, I learned a valuable lesson at my last race. The temperature was like 65, 60, 70 around there, but the humidity was 90%. And that's about the equivalent of like 85, 90 in the dry here. So it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was not ready for that. I didn't really know what that meant when you're running, but it's hard. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so when you wake up at five, what is, what is it then? About 70? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like high 60s. Uh, THG Sports Card says, thanks for fixing the iOS typing glitch. Going to test it out tomorrow. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Are we ready to do yeah, announcements? Yeah, let's do uh, announcements and mail days, and we'll go announcements first. What's the date, Chris? The date? Uh, May 17th, Friday. All right. We're back for the crossover May 17th. Yes. We are back. All right, announcements. Yes. I'm sorry. The... Typing glitch. So apparently sometimes on the iPhone, when you're typing a search on sales history, the cursor moves a little bit, which is horribly annoying if it happens even just once. So I've been working on that all day and I, I was working on it before and I thought I fixed it, but I didn't. So today I think I actually fixed it. Uh, still waiting for Apple, still waiting for Apple to approve it, but it should be there hopefully tomorrow before the show. So everyone, right. everyone's ready for the show. We've got some other announcements too. Yes. Came across the card letter feed. Yes. All right. The other one this is going to be hard to see. But the other one is Synonym Search, yeah. which is not the best name, but that's what we're calling it. So basically, when you search for specific terms, um, the way people list items, they list them differently. The biggest one is autograph. Some, like, I think Golden lists it as signed. Some call it autograph. Some call it auto. Some call it AU, right? Like, people list their titles differently. So the searches, you have to, like, either do them all separately or use Boolean search, which not a lot of people know how to do. So we've decided to just search them all for you for a, a few of the terms. So, like, for auto right here, um, these are all basically auto, but, like, yeah, see, here's one. So this one right here says SPX. Wait right here, SPX autographs, auto grade. So even though we only typed auto, you'll get results for autographs and auto and AU and signed and all that signatures, like all the different variations of that. And we did that for a bunch of different player nicknames like Shaq and Shaquille, Penny and Anthony, uh, Steph, Stefan. So that you don't have to like fumble around with all these different searches. Awesome. That's really awesome. Uh, what are some of the other terms? Like, I guess there's there's some names that uh, will have multiple results, auto, and all the different ways of spelling that. Here, here's the code. You can just see it. Nice. So, so rookie patch auto and RPA. Take the code down. <laughs> no one's stealing the code. Precious metal gems, PMG, all the die cut variations. Can you see those? There's yeah. so many. Tie dye. Auto, X Fractor, Refractor. Here's like some player nicknames Wemby, Wemanyama, Hollow, Holographic for the Pokemon people. Because I know a lot of listings do 
Oh, Jersey, Jersey's JSY. Those, that's an annoying one. I added Relic to that one. Um, patches, patch, authentic and auth. You know how some of those things do just auth. So that stickers, stickers, prospects, rookie RC. There's a bunch. Okay. All right, that's really cool. That's a that's a sweet addition to sales history. Are there any other announcements right now? I'm working on the next one, but I don't want to bring it up yet because we're still testing it. Fair. All right. Uh, what about mail days? Do you have any? No. I have like a, a mail day rant. <laughs> Even better. Let's go. <laughs> this is my card. Oh. You see it? Good. See it with your eyes? Can You, you can see You're it, right? The 2003 Topps Chrome Gold Refractor out of 50, LeBron James, card number one of 50. That's a, the Goodwill a, LeBron. Yeah, but it's just like like once a year but lately it's been like once a month someone digs it up the story that i made and they like make a post about it but they don't tag me even though like i'm all over it it's on my social media i have a video tagging myself like it's kind of annoying but i think because people just assume that that card has been through the vortex of like flipper nation and it's like six people away from me now but i still own it from that original purchase and story so which is what 2018 2019 <laughs> 19. Yeah. Damn, five years ago now. How about that? Mm -hmm. uh, South Park Cards had a question about this. He said, how many more posts about Josh's Goodwill LeBron until he's finally tagged? <laughs> we'll see. I've been, getting, I've been getting salty about it. Like, whoever makes it, I'm like, you didn't tag me. Fail. Tag me. Yeah, okay. All right. Do you want to say anything more do we want to say anything more just about kind of like if you're curating content make a make an honest give a good old college try to uh give credit when possible this one tagged me from blowout <laughs> <laughs> like they found it on blowout they're like yeah there's no way this guy's still collecting cards anymore he's exactly and people in the comments about it were really mean they're like they're like, yeah, it's probably fake. You probably don't even have it graded. Like, they're just questioning it. It's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> you guys got me. <laughs> oh, that's scary. All right. Cool. Good. Um, let's get to the questions. And so I posted uh, the call for questions late today. I almost forgot, and you and I were talking, and, so, and I, something reminded me that you said, I was like, oh, I have to make the post. <laughs> So we're a little bit lighter on questions this week. Might not need the full two hours this week. We'll see how this goes. Uh, all, right, all right, let's get to some questions here. First question, only question on the GameStop topic, comes from Reeves15PC, who says, how long until Sammy is selling Josh's LeBron to GameStop? <laughs> <laughs> That's the only question you got. That's the only question. Nobody cares about this in our world, but... Uh, I still think it's pretty interesting. It is interesting. Um, I'd be fascinated to know like what sort of clientele they're getting and what sort of offers they're getting so far. Yeah, so like basically the rundown is that GameStop storefronts in select cities right now are buying and selling cards in a certain value range that are PSA graded, right? right? Under five. Under five. Eight, eight, eight nine, ten. PSA, and it is. It's Pokemon and TCG and sports cards too? Yeah. Okay. So let's analyze this a little bit. What do you think about that? What does it say about the state of things? It's interesting for like the card shop world. Like, because mm. they're competing directly with card shops because this is what they do. But they're more upfront about exactly what they're buying. They are marketing that they're very liquid. They're willing to take on a lot of volume. It's interesting. Uh, yeah. is, they have like 300 storefronts. Uh, they haven't opened. They haven't opened it up of all of them, right? It's just in a few states. Yeah, I think it's limited. Maybe like a dozen states or something like that. I don't like eight. Eight. Like Connecticut, Tennessee, Texas. I I read it. I don't remember all of them. Okay. Yeah, I was just skimming over this because like it doesn't really apply to me. I don't ever foresee myself walking into a GameStop and selling a PSA eight Charizard or something, but. Uh, there's definitely the, the card store angle of this is like suddenly the number of card stores in the country is like verging on doubling or more, which is interesting. Although this is certainly 
a different experience than the car shop experience. Uh, what about the liquidity aspect of this? Like, can we talk a little liquidity? Yeah, this reminds me of like when I hear the stories of the Dallas show when people are walking around just buying out entire tables. This is what I think of. Just like they're gonna take on all, all this, all these cards, and then like either sell them through the store or maybe sell them on their eBay account in the future. I don't know. It's just, it's really just gonna like increase supply on this lower range of cards. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I my take on this, um, my glass half full take is that it's uh, it's pretty interesting that GameStop, which is a store that has a business model that's been put under a little bit of pressure because of the, you know, the, the storefront was designed to sell video games. And now those are increasingly purchased more and more through digital means. And uh, they're pivoting into a different physical thing that is not at risk of being digitized, which is sports cards. I think it's a testament to the enduring um, physical nature of sports cards and sports collectibles that this business is pivoting into ours because they want something physical to sell. And and cards are are a, a, something they've found worthy of a physical item selling in their store. I misspoke. I said 300 stores. They have 3,000 locations in North America, 5,700 worldwide. That is a lot of storefronts. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. yeah. That's that's going to be really uh, <laughs> just, just it's almost like just a snap of the finger and like 3,000 new card shops suddenly out there, but not quite, right? Like I don't I don't think there's any product being sold. I don't think they're doing breaking or anything. I think right now it's just transacting slabs. So very interesting. All right. Uh, next topic from the Bouvier. Let's talk about those Michael Jordan rookies that had authentic auto stickers stuck on them and got graded. Have you seen these? You showed me a picture. Can you pull up it again or refresh my memory? Yeah. <laughs> So what's going on? All right. So this is a 1986 Fleer, number 57, Michael Jordan, graded by BGS, BGS 7.5. And then there's Beckett Authentication Services involved as well that gave the autograph grade a 9. But the, the strange thing, the tricky thing, is that it's a sticker that presumably was taken off of a different card and put on this card and then sent off. Auction. This isn't the only one that was sent to auction. There's been quite a few. So here a, a, B, a BGS4 Auto 9 sold. Here a BGS6 Auto 10 sold. A BGS6.5 Auto 9. BGS7.5 Auto 9. It seems like maybe and they, they all sold through the same consigner. So it seems like maybe somebody got the idea to yeah. start slapping stickers on it. It's like to give you an example of the price, like the BGS4 with the, with the Auto 9 went for 7100 bucks. And the highest selling one in this little cluster was the BGS 7.5 Auto 9, which sold for 12200 And what does the BGS 4 sell without an auto, which is like a regular 86 flare? What does like a regular BGS 4 sell for? Yeah, what's the delta of the value that this sticker is adding? Uh, let's see, it's a good question. 1986 Fleer, Jordan, 57, BGS 4. About twenty five hundred bucks. So like four forty five hundred five grand, forty five hundred. Yeah. Yep. Can you even buy a sticker auto of MJ for Okay. Okay, so this is a good question. I didn't look at this and prepare or think about this, but like did they even make money by taking a sticker <laughs> off of the one card and putting it on this one? <laughs> this is the, I can't even believe the boundaries that are being pushed by all this crap. This is unbelievable. Like people will do anything to add a buck. This is why we've been harping on this custom card thing for so long with IP autos and all this stuff, because you just keep pushing the boundary to the point of like this people are ripping stickers off of other. This is so strange, dude. Yeah. I mean, I draw a really firm boundary myself as a collector at cards that are not on checklists. And there is no checklist that has 
1986 Fleer Jordan with a sticker taken off another card and put on it. So, oh, Amit says uh, the stickers came off of UNC Michael Jordan yeah. cards. Of course. And he of made course. me doing it. <laughs> so, I just presume that he bought those auto cards for like a thousand a piece. That's probably like conservative, but yeah. So he's making four, four grand per card on this. Yeah. I would love to have the opportunity to ask some ask the buyers what was going through their minds with this. Like, and and there are some people who take issue with uh, slabbing these, right? Like, because when it when it does get graded, you know, if you just kind of you look at the 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 slab says a nineteen eighty six Fleer number fifty seven Michael Jordan authentic aftermarket sticker. So that's good. I, I like that that. That it's stated clearly on the slab what this is. That this isn't a card from a product. It's a real. I mean, autograph. the underlying card is from a product, but sorry, what was that? It's a real autograph. Yeah, yeah. Uh, presumably it is. And uh, uh, do, you you know, think, do you think they sent those to PSA first and they got rejected? Question. Because I, you, you rarely see the BAS cards. Like people would probably prefer the. But I have PSA is probably like, what is happening here? What do you want us to do? Grade the sticker on top of the card? This doesn't even make any sense. It's not even a real. It's 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 like it's going against the intent of like what the autograph on a card is for with the IPs. Like you're actually sort of like backhanding the system here. Right. And you know, what if I were to cut a hole in the middle of the card and stuff? <laughs> a uh, a relic inside of it. What about that? Is Isn't that, that the thing? or just like tape it to the top of it? Yeah, it's just these are homemade cards. Um, and somebody out there, and this is I had this queued up in advance because I was going to try and find a way to maneuver this into the show, and I found an early opening, so I'm going to do it. Uh, somebody at home might be saying, "Was they listening to this?" Well, oh, your game used oh you know how are you gonna get a how are you gonna get a game used piece you know jerseys oh okay look at this i'm gonna do it here's how i'm gonna do it go on ebay and i'm gonna search michael jordan game used jersey 80 memorabilia pieces 80 for five thousand or best offer all right and Okay, so let's look at what this is. So this is 80 pieces of a Michael Jordan jersey stuffed into a Beckett slab with a Beckett authentication and a label that says Michael Jordan game use jersey, 80 memorabilia pieces. Oh. And what's so interesting about the listing is that there's two emails from Charles Stable. Or St- I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. I do recognize that name. Uh, there's two emails from Beckett's East Coast sales rep, Charles S., and he says, yes, straight from a game used to Jersey back in the day. And he also says it was a corporate deal that ended. So we sent back the pieces in a tamper-proof case for the customer to keep safe. They cannot be reused through us. 80 memorabilia pieces, five grand OBO on eBay. There's, there's multiple of these on eBay at any given time. Let's start cutting squares and cards, and we'll go buy this. Uh, we'll go buy this Jordan jersey, and uh, what is what's five thousand divided by eighty? What does that imply? Each of those pieces is worth roughly uh, three dollars. Yeah. Okay. Sixty-three bucks. Sixty-three bucks each. I mean, OBO though. OBO. I mean, we can retire. So like, let's just say thirty bucks a piece. Thirty bucks, yeah, thirty bucks a piece. There we go. What do you so think? Wait a minute. Are you saying that the value isn't in the little piece of jersey in the card? The value is in the card itself. There, you just are. Are you? Are you? Are you trying to say? That's I. Yes. Yes. That is always my agenda. This is the. Grand Canyon, right? And you're just leaping over it. You're making a big leap. This is just, I don't know. I don't know if I buy this. <laughs> people have been like, 
if those were if those weren't game used in that uh, Beckett slab, that thing would be two thousand OBO. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I don't like it, um, but you know what? The market speaks, and and uh, people paid money for these sticker cards. Um, <laughs> just it's not for me. That's all I can say. Getting it's getting weirder every week. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I don't know, let me leave a final remark on this that's a little more positive. Um, <clears throat> people are uh, very inventive and creative in the ways that they try to make money to, to squeeze a little extra juice from the fruit in the hobby. Well, so it's, it's, it's impressive <laughs> some of the stuff that people come up with. The word you're looking for is scam. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. Unless you have anything else on that one, Josh. No, I, Beckett needs to stop slabbing this junk. Even those jerseys. What is that? Yeah, I. I wouldn't uh, probably slab it if it was my call. Uh, <laughs> all right. From Pack Nicholson, I want to buy a card from someone on Instagram. <laughs> okay. But their profile does not have a pinned post that says legit in the Lego font. <laughs> the Lego font? Do? do you know what he's talking about? They, <laughs> it is. It's always in the Lego, the same font that like Lego, the company uses. It just, it's that font that says legit. I just assume that when I see that post, that actually means you're not legit. It's just like a really nice marker for me to know the opposite. Yeah, and it's always pinned, so it's always the first post. Good. And uh, I get why it exists. It exists because, like, in certain uh, silos of the secondary market for singles, you need reviews in order to feel comfortable doing deals with people. And so the legit post, the per the, the purpose of it is, Everybody that I've done a deal with, come put a comment on this post vouching for me so it can increase the confidence of other people doing deals with me. That basically seems to be the purpose. Yeah, except it's been bastardized and ruined and destroyed like everything else in the hobby. <laughs> also, I've had people like message me to comment on their legit posts that I've never done a deal with. And I'm like... <laughs> Should I go on there and be like, this person contacted me and told me to comment here, but please note, I have never done a deal with this person. So take every post, like, comment from this comment section with a grain of salt. Like, I, I said immediately deleted the DM. Because, like, yeah, because, like, even if you were to go do that, they own the post. They can just delete your comment. Yeah. Uh, Perimeter says, uh, also, not responsible for lost mail. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a tricky one. All right. Thank you, Pack Nicholson. Northwoods Card Collector says, when does your national plan, and then in parentheses, selling some cards to save money, buying cards to bring with you to the national, etc." When does that plan begin and what does it entail? That's a good question. Um, it's probably like a two month lead up to where you're starting to like think about maybe reducing some of your purchases so that you can have some extra cash in national just in case. Uh, we've had some decent luck at national, you know, finance stuff. So you never know. You might find something you like and you need the cash on hand. So maybe start planning a couple months out. Okay. Are you there now? I've been there for five months. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll start thinking about like getting stuff up, getting stuff together for the national two days before I depart. And then you know, it'll just mostly be wrangling up cards to grade. And then... Uh, Maybe a few cards if I feel like selling a few or trying to make some trades or something like that. Wouldn't yeah. recommend that approach, but uh, that's how I roll. 
you've done some pretty big trade ups with a bunch of stuff yeah. at Dallas and then you know, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it can happen. We can get some action. We can get some motion. It's good but, to just uh bring stuff for sure. If you're on the edge of like keeping it long term, maybe bring a few things and see what happens. Yeah, always wear comfortable shoes. <laughs> wear deodorant. <laughs> That, Bring that your phone content, charger. That content has, has grinded to a halt. Thank Where you. is it? Yeah, did we put that content out of business? I wouldn't want to. I think we shamed it so much that people are afraid. <laughs> it shouldn't go away. It should, there's a place for it. Think about all the people who are going to have their first national this year. And, like, they need, they deserve a, a round of that content. True. Well, there's, you can just go watch the video with me and Justin from four years ago. It is evergreen. That's the tricky part. Right. All right. Uh, do you have any specific plans for the national? I booked my flight for the national three days ago. So is that? It was yesterday. <laughs> it was yesterday. Stop it, Joshua. What yesterday? I booked it with. Oh my gosh. And uh, I'm. I booked it with Frontier Airlines. It's bad. There's only one direct flight from Phoenix to Cleveland. That's with Frontier Airlines. Okay. So I'll be living that that Lameem life. <laughs> it's not quite a. It's not quite spirits. It's the same thing. They're the same. Oh no, that's awful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe Mike. You better watch out if it does. It's better than losing your hair. <laughs> all right uh 1956 tops guys says when you watch players that you collect do you have your cards by your side <laughs> if not do, do it uh, uh no yeah i don't do it either isn't there another question about this like yeah yes. there's, there's a more uh detailed question coming right after this because i wanted to hear your answer to the next one okay yeah i just uh i usually do have a pile of cards though you know but like i don't i don't get any i actually want the cards away from me i'm what if i get upset and like damage one of the cards yeah you're like just holding them while you're watching the game like, go go <laughs> yeah. no like the time to enjoy the sport itself is a very different session than when i'm enjoying the cards session? yeah those are two totally different sections. Uh, there's a time for viewing the sport, and then there's a time for breaking out the box and looking at the cards. So during these sessions, do you get some candles? <laughs> Maybe some music? You know, I, I haven't needed to resort to that, but I'm not above it. <laughs> Good. Good. All right. Uh, uh, all right, so here's the next one from Cali Dreaming 84 from Joe. When watching an important game of a player that you personally collect, how much of your rooting interest is amplified by the fact that you collect that player? To what degree, if any, do you feel there are aspects of collecting an active player that are similar to gambling? And if so, is that a good or a bad thing? I want to hear your ears on this first. Well, I'm going to zag against this question right away. Um, there's like an assumption behind this question that you're not gambling or you're gambling less if uh, you collect retired players and yeah maybe you are gambling less but you're still um, impacted by the results of live sports in meaningful ways so I guess like the best example I could give is like if you collect the player who's top 10 all time in the sport, but like he's at the bottom of the top 10 and all of a sudden there's some new active players who are accumulating resumes that are threatening to displace your retired player. There, there's risk. There's a gamble involved in that, which is maybe my top 10 player gets displaced from top 10 lists and their, their uh, cachet gets lessened. So there's a gamble in retired players too. And also not just the top 10 scenario, but like if you collect a player who's considered the best of all time in the sport, um, like Babe Ruth or something, and then 
there or Tom Brady, and then there's a guy knocking at the door who can potentially dethrone that player. That could have meaningful consequences to the value of your collection. So what do you? Let me stop there and see if you have any thoughts on that. Well, did you do you remember when Shaq went on the interview with Jokic after the MVP and he's like, just so you know, I voted for SGA. <laughs> oh, yeah, did you yeah, yeah. Catch that? Oh yeah. You know why he said that? Because he's worried about his legacy. Yeah, because Jokic is knocking on the Shaq and Hakeem doors right now, right? right. Like he, and he's been it's been coming up. Like is is Jokic moving into the top ten all time? And so Shaq's getting worried, Hakeem's getting worried. And those guys are like actively trying to protect themselves by voting for other players. Yeah. <laughs> so like those those guys are doing it. And so you know that collectors are definitely thinking the same thing. They're rooting so you're saying like people are rooting against people when they collect retired players. To a certain extent they are. Yeah. So yeah. Everyone just wants Jason Tatum to win because he's not threatening anything. <laughs> I think that that went yes. As as a as a player, as a collector of retired players myself. I always find myself rooting for the Kawhi, the Tatum, <laughs> yeah. you know, the guy who's like, he's not, he's not calling for any of the Harden. Harden. Harden, yeah, yeah. The Clippers, yeah. when the Clippers lost, everyone's like, ah. <laughs> the Clippers are such an easy team to root for, for that, because, because actually the, some of the players on the Clippers, like Harden, Westbrook, Paul George in particular, like, their resumes should have a championship on them, just from the caliber of player that they are. It would like set the universe a little more balanced. Uh, well, they would have a championship if those three Christie men stayed together in OKC. Oh, okay. Christie says if uh, Durant, Westbrook, and Harden just stayed in Oklahoma City together, maybe they would have a championship. Right, now, just like to the to the the heart of this question, um, okay. So, collecting active players is a little bit different from gambling in the sense that uh, you don't need to cash out your t- ticket. Like, you know, if you're, if you're holding, if, if first of all, most bets in gambling are just like all or nothing propositions that terminate by the end of a game or by the end of a quarter or by the end of a season. But if you're holding like a futures ticket. Even then, you have to like make moves on it. If you like, you know, you know that guy who just cashed out his uh, parlay. The guy had the parlay of uh, the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl, Rangers winning the World Series, and the Oklahoma City Thunder winning the championship. Payout was one point seven million. He put a hundred bucks. Payout was one point seven million. If all three things happened, two of the three happened, and then he cashed that out after the Thunder tied up their semifinal series two to two. Right. Right. And he cashed out for like 80 grand. And then there were gamblers online who were like, you could have, like, the expected value of that ticket is much higher than 80 grand. You could have gotten probably twice that in the secondary market. So, okay, so you have to make these moves in the moment. You don't, like, that, like, that ticket is worthless. It goes from 80 grand cash out to zero as soon as the Thunder go out. So even futures tickets expire relatively quickly cards don't expire they their values can definitely <laughs> expire to some degree they can also go up they can go down but it's just such a different experience it's, it's a much more hopeful experience when you're collecting cards of a player and even if it doesn't work out this year i'll hold on to these cards you know i like the player i have fun collecting and maybe next year you know there's there's no maybe next year with a gambling ticket i think that's a big difference what do you think yeah, agreed. I mean, collecting like, like an old active player like LeBron for me is a little less of what you're talking about on like the the gambling feeling of it. Um, but even so, like like you're saying, the day to day when like in 2020 and 2021, when a bunch of new companies were popping in, there was like this feeling that oh, we can somehow cash in on like the day to day gambling of players through sports cars and that just never was realistic that was like an experience speaking and it's because you know the cards just don't move like that on a single game i mean the bowl bowl one is a fun thing that happened during the i think that was a preseason game or like a summer league game or something where he had that one awesome game and prices doubled but on the whole that's a pretty you know rare exception it's it's yeah i really like that uh train of thought because 
there always was this idea that there will be a stock market for cards that treats a player's box score like the quarterly earnings report. And, you know, if player scores a bunch of points on this day, then it goes up. And if they score less, it goes down. And like you said, cards are never moved that way. The, the thing, the way that cards move, the thing that will excite a market for a player, like what we've been seeing for Anthony Edwards the last few weeks, is not their performance in one night or a week or a month even, or a year even. The thing that excites the market is the is a believable notion that there's going to be a legacy factor at play here. That yeah. the believability of the of Anthony Edwards becoming an all time great. That's what's exciting. It's, it's not just one game. It's not just one playoff series. It's a culmination of things and factors that contribute to the idea that I'm really excited. I want to pay more for this player's card than anybody's ever paid before because there's a shot that they can become an all time great. Yeah, because like he hit this sort of like internal checklist for people where he took out Durant or he took out like a, a player that potentially people see him getting to legacy wise long term. So they see that as like, oh, if he can get past Durant, you start getting excited and thinking about what's he gonna do five years from now, right? It's not necessarily that one exactly. game. And that is that is so antithetical to what a gambler right. or what gambling what a gambler is thinking or what gambling is about. Gambling is about you know, trying to take a, a scientific approach to a single event or a sequence of events that are finite and that end. It's it's not about it's not thinking about like what's the cultural impact on the long term if this player you know breaks through in the next few years. So I was listening to uh, the Ringer Gambling Pod with Solak leading up to. The- NFL season and going into week one his like big bet was that AJ Brown was going to catch over seven balls or something like that and they're like oh you think he's going to have a good season he's like I have no idea I just know that in training camp you know the beat writers are reporting that the early season they're looking to like get him going this season and funnel him a bunch of passes so, like in the first week I'm, I'm literally just going to bet on this week one I have no idea what's going to happen after that I don't care it's like they have a the gamblers on the the Sharks and all those guys that are really smart are actually looking super short-term. Absolutely. All right. Uh, uh, from Jesse J. Pender, Bill Simmons seems to be into cards, at least somewhat. His main book chapters often start with a sports card. If you were asked to go into his show to talk about LeBron collecting or Jokic collecting, uh, uh, would you do it? And if so... How do you explain to the masses what cards they should collect if you were squeezed on that topic? How do you give recommendations and advice without creating a middle finger graph? Interesting. Well, we're going to have probably different answers on this one. I know how you feel about Bill. <laughs> I, would, I love Bill. Bill's great. You would probably not go on the show, right? Um, oof. I think it'd be fun to go on the show, don't you? Yeah, I was just thinking, like, when we do our appearances on other podcasts, we just, like, bring a bunch of data and indexes and charts and stuff. I would probably do something similar, which would probably freak him out. Oh, my God, stats and numbers. Can you imagine? <laughs> You're like, just give me the just give me the short, like, eye, term, the eye test on these guys, and that's what I need to hear. <laughs> um, I would bring a bunch of stats and start talking about, you know, graphs and stuff like that. And then it kind of seems like the question asker is asking, like, would we give the elevator pitch on the hobby to try to you know convince people to join the hobby which we've talked about on the show a lot that that's not as successful as it might seem you know especially when it's coming from like oh join because the 2020 you know rise up and cards are here to stay and liquidity and marketplaces and stuff like that but we because the question is like who would you tell people on the podcast to collect and it's like man i would tell them to collect their favorite players you know exactly yeah my uh, favorite way of uh, pitching the hobby or explaining the hobby is uh, not to try to uh, market or convince anybody of anything. I would just take it as an autobiographical question. Mm. If, if, if they said, you know, what would you say about the hobby if somebody is interested in it? Or I would say, I don't know. I, the hobby is not for everybody. <laughs> it's really not for most people probably. But for me... 
my mixture of nostalgia, enjoying collecting things, enjoying sports, caring about legacies, loving statistics, loving markets, um, loving the community aspect of the hobby. For me, it's just, it's a really simple equation. And it's that collecting cards, I compare my life pre-card collector and post-card collector. And my life after collecting cards is just so much better. It, it's such a, compared to what I was doing with that free time before I became a card collector, like there are so many worse things I can be doing and scrolling on my phone than looking at eBay and talking to people on Instagram and sharing opinions on the market and stuff like it's just made my life better. It, it doesn't mean that's going to work that way for other people. But for me, it just, just checks a lot, a lot of boxes. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, even just like on our Instagram feeds now and our lives, we're just getting marketed and like pitched on these things, trying to be sold on things all the time. So like we're pretty immune and like skilled at, at avoiding crap like that. So I think if you went on the podcast and started trying to convince everybody, it would just come off disingenuous. So if you're just like, you know what, that's not the pitch. Here's why I like it. If you can relate to that and that sounds interesting to you and you have nostalgia for something like that, here's like the education side of it. Here's how you could jump in if you're looking for help. Other, other than that, you know, move on or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And like if people have questions about like, hey, like how did you start collecting LeBron? And how did, how did you develop and how did you learn things? Like you can, those are questions that you can jump all over and give like in-depth answers to. And that's how I would want to approach a topic about that. It's like, hey, if somebody's interested, we can talk about how it played out. But I honestly find, I, it's not only is it not beneficial to the other person, I can't stand trying to talk to somebody about something about myself or trying to convince somebody to like something that they don't want to like. And I'm just like, this is just a waste of time. Yeah. Why are we do doing this? <laughs> yeah, remember the Bob M track interview whenever I'm looking for some inspiration I'll just listen to him talk about like his own journey of his collection and like when he got started before anyone else cared about cards and that kind of I just related to that story more and it gets me more fired up to keep going you know so it's a great point definitely all right um what about this part of this question where it's like how do you explain to the masses which cards they should collect? So like, let's say Bill Simmons is really interested in it. And we say, yeah. hey, Bill, who's your favorite player? And he says, Larry Bird. And then he's like, well, how do I get started? How do I make an impressive Larry Bird collection? How do I meet the people I need to meet? You know, how do I get, do I need to meet? Like, how do you answer that part of it? When, when, it get, when we identify the player and he's like, how do I start making a collection? How do I figure out if I like this? so hard because I mean most people that answer that would be like oh you need to get his 1980 tops with Irving and Magic and you need to get the 81 tops and you know you just like send them down that but I think maybe what the question asker is like would we recommend like a specific type of significance for a card or a rarity or like a set or a brand or something that they should explore maybe which is which is tough man there's like and people give me this question all the time, like, um, is there like a website or something I can go to to like learn all the sets and like just figure out? No, there's not. So it's tough. Yeah. And like, it's hard, even, even if I could just like give him a spreadsheet that had every Larry Bird card, that doesn't solve the harder part of it, which is like deciding in which ones to buy. Right. That's something that almost has to be done through trial and error. And it's, and it's almost like I don't want to steal from that person the joy of discovery. Right? Yes. It's like it's a huge part of collecting. It's one of the best parts of collecting, I think. Do you agree? Yeah. You need like three years of buying the wrong stuff, you know, yeah. just to like then make it more apparent when you start getting into the stuff that does make sense that you should have been buying, that makes it more enjoyable at that point. Yeah, it does. I've always liked the approach, too, of just, like, if you're brand new, if I was brand new, I would uh, go buy a box of cards for a few hundred bucks. And then I would 
force myself to dispose of every card in that box. I would, and then that leads me down so many paths naturally. That would lead me to grading because I would need to figure out if there, if, if I want to sell the items of this box, I have to figure out which ones are worth grading. That's how I'm going to be able to get the most money from those. So I would figure out what ones need to get graded, and I learn all about grading. I learn how that works. I learn about different grading companies. Like it just, I learn about eBay. I learn about how marketplaces work. I, I meet people. That's to me. That's always going to be. And, and I get to figure out right away. Like, do I enjoy this process? Do I enjoy throwing stuff up on eBay? Do I enjoy sleeving these cards? Do I enjoy looking at them? You know, do I enjoy the, the research of learning, like, what's in the checklist? What could I have gotten out of this box if I would have got the best possible card? Who are the important rookies, et cetera? I think that's that's a really good way to figure out quickly. Figure out like that's, that's a great idea. If you told Bill, hey, go buy the 80 tops and 81 tops for – he goes on eBay and he buys them and he gets them. They hit his mailbox a week, six years later, he buys them through a vault. <laughs> like – then he messages me. He's like, okay, now what? I did that. I'm like, now what? It's like, oh, I just gave you the two best, you know, it's like two of his biggest cards. Yeah. Like, well, that wasn't much fun. Like, I, I did it so easily. You know, I just now, like, all the joy has been stripped of it, you know? It's like, yeah, that was bad advice. You should have, I should have told you nothing. <laughs> right. For sure. Exactly. All right. <clears throat> Next question here from Istanbul Cards. Can we put that on the title? What? This? I should have told you nothing. <laughs> okay, good. Um, it is right. like 45 minutes of silence on the bill. That'd be better than listening to Van Latham. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. From Istanbul Cards, how do you view cards that are relisted on auction a week after they sell an auction? Is there a way to do that? I think with this question is getting at is like, what do you think about relisted items? Like, a card sells at auction, then a week later it's relisted. What do you, what are your thoughts on that scenario? Like we're saying it wasn't paid, or someone's literally listing it that quickly. I I suppose take it in either direction. I usually assume that it was unpaid because like they give them a week to pay, and then after the week or whatever, maybe that's their timeline. Same. Okay, he's in the chat. He says a card that was likely shill. Yeah. Uh, does it? Do, I guess maybe like, do you hold it against the card mm. <laughs> that some that it was getting manipulated? No, but like, like if it happens like two and three times in a row, kind of at a certain point, it's like the good the card just has like a stain on it and through no fault of of the card or the owner or whatever, you know, it just does what happens. Yeah, it's uh, it starts to if it just happens once and it's just one card and it's just a one off, but if there starts to develop a trend of like car, this particular car, this particular player is constantly being relisted. It starts to feel like that's not, not a market that I feel confident buying cards in. I'm worried that I'm going to get shilled if I start placing bids. Yeah. Do you feel like you've been getting, do you feel like the shilling is the same as it's always been? Or do you feel like it's different and they either worse or better? Ah, man, that's a good question. I haven't, I don't, I need to think about that for a second. What, how do you feel? I don't know. Like we talk about it more, and we're more like aware of it and thoughtful about it. It, it, but overall, it probably feels similar. Yeah. Over the last five to six years. Yeah. Just because it has been going on, but I guess I, I get worried. Just it's like whenever you know, like when a card you really, really want hits a public auction, and you get this initial like reaction of yes, this is great. I'm finally going to get a chance, and then it's like the second one is like oh my god, just please let me. Have have a fair shake and just getting this without any shenanigans or zero zero feedback people bidding me or watching it rise up to it's like 90 percent of its market value in the first hour for no apparent rate like all these things just start immediately making me worried and it just it sucks yeah exactly yeah i don't i haven't noticed that shelling is happening dramatically more or less than at any point in time um it's it's ironic but one of the things that actually draws out a lot of shill bidding is organic market growth. And then the shill bidders see that as an opportunity to pile on and to like yeah. turbocharge and organic market growth. I've seen a lot of shill and Anthony Edwards cards over the last few weeks. 
um, in addition to plenty of legitimate, authentic transactions. And it just said, that's typical. When there's a hot market, the shield bidders are like, you know, the, the fraudsters are like flies to a light. Yeah. And they see an opportunity to push it up further. They start ripping stickers off the UNC cards. <laughs> yeah. Um, Edwards market is still going up. Like, do you think that our indexes are lagging because of just like the way that the indexes work? Or is totally. it still going No, the, the indexes are definitely lagging. And there's stuff that's like just getting captured now that's over, that's, that's uh, contracting other stuff. So, like, it's exquisite. His, his BGSA, yeah, his BGSA 5 and TRPA just sold for an all-time high uh, yesterday in PWCC Premier. Uh, so that, that, like, it reflects in the index as a price increase. But, and it's actually, because it is a price-weighted index, that price increase is papering over the price decrease that's happening on, like, his Prism Silver PSA 10 right now. So the PSA Silver Prism 10 topped out at about two grand on May 9th, and now it's down to about 1100, 1200. So it's mm. already taken a pretty big hit um, off the peak, 30, 40% off the peak. So, so, you know, there's different things happening in the market at different times too. That's another factor is like certain cards move up while others run up really quick and then correct. So, all right. Uh, next question here from Drake's PC. With PWCC announcing that they will remove fixed price listings that have gone unsold for more than 60 days in an effort to promote fresher inventory, to promote increased visibility and pricing optimization, do you think it would benefit the hobby if other fixed price marketplaces such as eBay and MySlabs followed suit? Do you see any negatives to PWCC and potentially others doing this? Mm -hmm. I, was, I saw this question. And I was thinking through the negatives, but I personally think this is great for someone that's like tired of seeing the same cards listed at 10x their value, just rotting on there, especially cards that other copies of cards that I own. Like, just take it down, man. You're not going to sell it for just like, if you're going to sell it, sell it at auction or, or list it at a reasonable price or just take it down. Yeah, the, I, I think like the ideal would be that sellers would volunteer would voluntarily choose to take down a card if within sixty days it hasn't gotten action. It's like okay, the market is probably telling you that uh, your price is not correct. <clears throat> it's kind of like uh, houses on Zillow that just sit there for years, you know, <laughs> like. Like there's a like there's a reason why nobody's buying us, and it's the price. So I think that's good. I also, um, as, in terms of the negatives, there have been times where, especially like years ago, more so than today, but there would be times where a card would sit on eBay, and the price just seems ridiculous. But like a year goes by two years go by three years go by and all of a sudden a few offers start going in and then all of a sudden you know the car has been sitting there for five years and somebody buys it uh that that happened with a michael jordan 1997 game jersey autograph out of 23 cards. i was gonna bring that one up that's exactly what i was thinking of what do you remember about that one how did that work i don't remember the the price, but it was on eBay forever, and it, people talked about it all the time. Because if you sorted by Michael Jordan highest price, it was always in the top. And I think someone ended up just buying it. Yeah, yeah they did. There's they a selling after like five years of sitting there. Like, I think the ask was like a million bucks. After like five years of sitting there, somebody finally bought. It. There's the same exact thing for two LeBron cards. There was a BGS nine five RPA at a ninety nine, sitting at two hundred fifty k for years for years and then someone bought it and obviously it was worth a lot more than that shortly after and then the finest card that i wanted was sitting on there for years for it was like 30 grand and it was like 30 grand you insane like you know 
And it's like, I ended up paying more than that for mine. It just, it's like, you know, it's just how, how it happened so fast. It felt like. It does. The, the patience is crazy. Wasn't the Jordan like a nice patch oh, yeah. too? It was like, yeah. it had like silver and blue on it and stuff. Remember that one? Yeah, it was sick. It was awesome. It's a really, yeah. really great example of that guy. Um, but yeah, the patience to do that is just, uh, it's just crazy, man. I'm like. I would go nuts if I had a card of mine sitting on eBay for years. You know, it's like a sign would adjust the price. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, is it this one? It might be this one. Hold on. I think that is the one. I think that is the one. Yep. <laughs> it sold privately for 2.7. That was after the eBay. Uh, thing. Yep. That's definitely the one. It's just like seeing that image. I'm like, man, I remember seeing that on top of you. Because every once in a while, I'm sure you do this. You'll just search your favorite player and sort by highest price just to see. And this is always sitting there for the Jordan guys. Yep. Sure, sure was. Most of the matches look like this. Yes. Most of them are napkins. Yeah. Yep. He brings back some real memories. When, once you once that question came up, I'm explaining that we were both thinking that Jordan. I just, <laughs> it was almost like we all talked talked about it too like it was like oh, yeah. a, it had like a legend around the card like is anyone ever going to buy this they're just going to have it listed there just to show off and so you do kind of lose that aspect of like showing off your virtual collection through overpriced stuff yep, yep you do that was a simpler time too um almost every sports card transaction was happening on ebay whereas now yeah. you know you have the pwcc fixed Market plus, fixed price marketplace. You have, you have uh, eBay, obviously. You have my slabs. You know, you have however many auction houses and their vaults and like their fixed. Market. It's just a lot different now. It's uh, sometimes the same card will be like on ten of them. Yeah. <laughs> Overall, I am in favor of that though. Like, I think look, that's good. Look at you. Sure, you're good with it. All the time. <laughs> yeah. What's that like for millions? Yeah. Three million. I saw. I just filtered by like best offer and sorted by highest price. Look, this is like You're cards that should not right now. Yeah, I'm in shock. And then just like cards that are for sure not supposed to be up. <laughs> <laughs> that Russell Wilson one. That's that's the new staple of just the. Uh, because I'll do that. I I'll go to shop. Like sometimes I'll set it to usually I'll set it to only auctions and just filter by highest. Just see what's out there, and yeah, that Russell Wilson will come across my path. There's a leaf, a Mike Tyson leaf card for 1.5 mil. If you want to jump on that one, yeah. <laughs> There's a Mickey Mantle IP auto. Do you think uh, does it hurt the brand of the marketplace that hosts those um, unrealistic asks? You think that's what PWCC is thinking? Like we're tired of this; these making us look bad or something. Yeah, I think I, I think PWCC has signaled a few on a few different occasions over the years that they don't like just having stale inventory that's ridiculously overpriced. Would, I think it like creates a. I think they hear a lot of complaints about it from their customers, being creates a bad customer experience. I think they'd much rather, and, and obviously those cards aren't selling. You know, they're just taking up real estate. They're taking up uh, digital real estate on their website. Yeah, like if I sort by price, my eyes are wasting time. Exactly. Like I, I could, I could be looking at cards that are actually the best in shop that are available for real prices, but I, that's impossible to do when you sort by price. That's why I, whenever I sort by price, I filter by auction. Mm. It's like, what's the point of me looking at? That's why eBay is so silly for letting people, letting you sort by price by auction where you can start to bid at a million because it's like okay now i gotta filter by bids of more you know more than zero bids like gosh yes it, as i think about it more too like if i go to a marketplace and the first thing i see is a bunch of ridiculously overpriced cards i immediately think nobody here is serious i'm not yeah. going to be able to make any progress set in offers here i'm wasting my time here yeah that's i'm glad you brought that up just thinking about well, seeing that on the PWCC vault, it does give me this feeling as a collector of like, this is a waste of my time looking through all this stuff. Like, I'm, how can I even find? And the other part is, um, 
I'm not very, very incentivized to come back the next day and check for new inventory because it's just going to be either the same old stuff that I saw yesterday or if there is something new it's going to be overpriced as well exactly all right a lot of good takes on that topic right there I think that was nice yeah I think if you just want to show off your card you should really just go to card lot or showcase and show them off nice and, then, and there's no prices there are no prices on card letter showcase all right uh uh, next question here from Jeff Rose, Jordans, and more. I side PC Harold Miner <laughs> and re recently acquired both his 2012 FLIR Retro Showcase out of 100, Platinum Medallion out of 100, and Super Rave out of 50. Should post playing days cards be considered when determining what is someone's best card, or should they be a separate thing? Because both of those cards are obviously better than anything Harold Miner had during the Junk Wax era. And so just for those who don't know who Harold Miner is, he was in the NBA in the 90s. At one time he was dubbed Baby Jordan and uh, <laughs> never became adult Jordan. Um, no, no he's, uh, no, he's not nearly that good. No offense to Harold Miner. He was an NBA player, but uh, <clears throat> never reached uh, an all-star all level, I don't think. His most expensive card ever sold is $500, and it's only because the set was famous nicknames, and on the thing it says Baby Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this, is a, this points out the problem that I think Larry Bird collectors, Dr. J collectors, Green collectors have, which is like, <laughs> Their coolest cards are clearly like exquisite cards or something like that, right? What do you what do you think about this? Yeah, when you brought that bird question, I didn't want to get into that, but my thought was like, uh, you're probably looking at exquisite because yeah. I just can't think. Kareem is the other one I think of, like because if you want to collect his rookie card, it's like you know you're basically trying to save up to get the highest grade you possibly can. It's just it's not much of a hunt and a collecting feat, um, and so I'm like. Okay, he's got he's got like the Fleer retro stuff, which is might be semi interesting to some people, but it's like unlicensed post playing days, and then exquisite, like you said. So I get I get what the question asker is getting getting at, because like Harold Miner's playing in the early nineties, it's all junk wax. I don't think he has anything like he doesn't have like a green PMG sale or anything. I don't even think he played that long, right? He was out of the league by then. Right. Exactly. He does sign with Panini though. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess like the answer to this question is, uh, you have ideals. Yeah. You have the the perfect conception of what a player's card catalog would look like, but at the end of the day, you have to play the hand that you're dealt. And if the hand that you're dealt is junk wax, and then post playing day is unlicensed or partially licensed cards, that's the hand you're dealt. Yeah. And you have to make the most of that. So each player's catalog has to be on some level treated on its own and evaluated on its own. And so like the, one of the risks though, like, like so it kind of goes back to the question of why, did, why should we only focus on rookie year cards? Or why should we only focus on playing ace cards? And the reason why those principles exist is to limit the scope of cards to fight against the onslaught of cards that would come if manufacturers could just print a bazillion cards every year of every player and completely dilute the supply. As collectors, we have to protect rarity. So you can take those principles and apply them in scenarios where the question of playing days or post playing days isn't a, isn't a factor. But you can apply the principle. You can say, well, how do I carve out rarity in that context. And one of the ways you can do it, one of the ways that collectors have historically done it is focusing on firsts. Because one of the things you're gonna worry about if you're collecting Harold Minor FLIR retros, what happens if there's another FLIR retro set next year? And then there's another one after that. And, there's another, and how do you differentiate? Um, how do you just stop the supply from just becoming diluted? And so then you would focus on firsts. You'd say, well, what is the first year of Harold Miner Fleer retro cards. And so that's one way to create rarity against the threat 
of a flood of supply. All right. Uh, from 240 cards. Would you have something, John? I just like, like, I can't get it out of my head, but I have to say it. It just has to come out of my mouth. Minor, I hardly knew her. <laughs> okay, there so, we go. He played four years. He retired in 95, 96. Yeah. Didn't, yeah, he didn't really have a long career. All right. From 240 cards. I'm not here to change anybody's mind. But. But. <laughs> <laughs> but relic cards get bashed on this show. First of all, don't you have a ton of relic cards? Can we just get that out of the way? I have a few myself. Christina, I have a few. Uh, yeah. There's it's a lot so of good. great, exquisite patch cards. I want to know what the definition of relic is. Maybe the question answer is getting there, but is there like a, is relic like a more generic term for Jersey that encompasses Jersey and patch or is it? I think it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Relics can also include like, I think a, 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 bat. Yeah, a, a slice of a bat. It can include a strand of Abraham Lincoln's hair. And it also includes like the sneakers. Yeah. Relic is the broadest. If there's something shoved in that card, it's a relic. <laughs> All right. Uh, See, I, just I didn't want to like be lumped in with you're like you've got a bunch of relics. Like, hold on a second. Okay, good point. Fair. I don't you, have you LeBron. Have patch, you have patch cards. I don't have jockstrap cards. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the question goes on. Relic. Own the whole jockstrap, right? <laughs> yeah, I like I like to have a whole jockstrap. <laughs> Relics predate cards by thousands of years. They talk about holy relics in the Bible and family. Is Christina, is that true? What? Do they talk about? Oh, sorry. The stars just scored because oh. they're calling it a no goal. The stars are in overtime. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. What was the question? Does the Bible talk about holy relics? Yes. Yeah. Well, right. No, the Bible does not. The what about a holy grail? Church doctrine does. All right. And families used to hand down armor for generations. Correct. <laughs> holy relic jockstrap patch. Okay. <laughs> what does it say? What's the definition of relic there, Josh? There's a few definitions. An object surviving from an earlier time, especially one of historical or sentimental interest. And then the second one, that word right there. Part of a deceased holy person's body. <laughs> so I think, I think relic is like the original term for this like memorabilia category. Like I collect a, you know, Moses staff or something like that. That's a relic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> hold on, I just got to jot something down here. There's people that collect like old documents and stuff, you know, like from the 1700s and like old, old documents from uh, explorers or things like that. Would those be considered relics as well? Yep, they sure do. Uh, Under the first definition, a card could itself could be a relic. All right, but uh, the question was on, relics predate cards by thousands of years. They talk about holy relics in the Bible and families used to hand down armor for generations. I know the jersey has been cut but it's easy to store and has extra authentication. I've seen Black Jesus perform a miracle in a game. Could relics give powers if touched? If I didn't care so much about it being slapped. So this guy loves relics. This guy needs to buy the uh, the MJ eighty piece. Exactly. Thing. I've been- I think we just made a match. I think we just made a match here. I don't know where to go with this question, but um, I'm happy you like relics. All right. Uh, Sports card aesthetic says, given how bad slash lazy autographs have become on modern cards, it reasons that making players sign less would improve quality. What would be your ideal number of rookie autos for one player the total number would it be 500 110 even what if it was just one what if it was one carefully written autograph what do you think about this 
Yeah, I mean, collectors are always going to want things to be limited if they can, if they can, you know, get their hands on that more limited thing. They they want to be a part of something more limited. I was talking to somebody in the TCG space, and I told them that I really liked the designs of the. Um, I'm getting way off base, but it'll make sense. The designs of the, the Disney was it the Lorcana one or one of the, not the top scroll the Lorcana? I said I liked the design of it. I thought they were neat looking cards. My son likes them. And they're like, yeah, collectors really like that because it was like a more limited release, but the people who play the game hate it because they didn't make enough of it. You can't even play the game. And it's like this constant battle between like how many of something do we make to appease the collectors who end up with them versus enough to like sell them in the boxes to where the manufacturers make money, the people are happy with the supply, the breakers, in this case, the TCG players. And it's just like, this really interesting, you know, line you have to you have to figure out like where do, where does it go? What's the number, the magic number to, to make everybody happy where we all profit and stuff and keep people coming back for the next one where they're not gonna be burned because we overprinted and we made the junk wax, you know, it's like this infinite struggle. Uh so that's what that's what I thought of when I saw this question. Yeah. Okay. So there's always a balance between we have thousands of people who want these rookie autographs, and uh, uh, <laughs> the player has every incentive in the world to just rip through those autographs as fast as they can. Like, how many times do you hear people complain, like, oh, Luca has too many rookie autographs compared to my favorite rookie, and when he played, there was only a thousand total autographs. It would be, you know, but then people are complaining that Luca doesn't sign enough because they want it in their breaks and their products. So, like, which is it? What do we want? Do we want to sign a thousand rookie autographs total we want fifty thousand so we all have a shot what is it yeah it's very, very true um the other thing i think about is like no matter how many autographs the player signs at the direction of the manufacturer there's still going to be the secondary market for aftermarket autographs and the players are still going to just rush through those anyway like if a player is inclined to sign a lot their autograph is going to get crazy circulation. Mm-hmm. You can't choke it off. Um, but like I get what the question is getting at here. It's like, hey, look, what if we just had the player sign a hundred autographs? We just had one autograph signing session. You just signed a hundred rookie autographs, and like it's really emphasized. Like we want you to really sit down and take your time and carefully do it. Right. I get, I get the sentiment behind that. This, I, and let me post this today. Hold on a second. Um, <laughs> you see this? Yeah. It's, really, yeah. it's like the same set, but he doesn't get <laughs> kind of at the end. So, like, he, this is kind of getting to the point of the question. Like, do the signers themselves get like exhausted by? Oh my gosh, there's ten thousand of them. I'm never gonna get through this unless I shorten this and make them ugly. Yep. Exactly. Uh, I, I think it's also good on a certain level to like, it sucks that the quality of the autographs are bad, but it's good to have a bunch of them up front because like, I think there's oftentimes a misconception about how rare a, most athletes' autographs are going to be, and they're never as rare as it seems. Mm-hmm. Like, just let's just not deceive, let's not allow the deception to exist. Let's just put all the autos out there because they're coming. Like, go to an NBA game and watch how many autographs get signed. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. These guys are really, They're really good at it, too. They're good at ripping yep. through them. Yep. Yes, they are. But the Wemby <laughs> autos will be rare, right? The, all right. They'll be rare. Exactly. My, my investment's safe with Wemby. I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's never going to sign again. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thompson's right. going to be like, you know what? We're good. We don't, we don't just sign right. anymore. How do we want to make money? money. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Uh, from Fresh Vines 101, what are your thoughts on the new PSA slabs? Will you be sending in any of your old slabs to get re-slabbed? The, I'm very curious to know this from you because I know that your pile of slabs needs a level of uniformity. You know what? I'm starting to feel like an iPhone user. Like, 
you just got to make me get the newest phone. Make, make a slight little change so that me, the sucker of the PS8 slab, is just like, let me just send you my whole PC. And I mean, if they'll like re slab them for a nominal fee, I guess, but the risk of like sending them in and stuff is not worth it. I'm definitely tempted though by like the heavier plastic without the sleeve and all that stuff. They're saying all the things to get me excited, but. I'm feeling like an iPhone user. Have you had a chance to see one in hand yet? Neither have I. All right. Uh, longer question from Prison Mike PC, but he really needs our help. He says, this is not a hypothetical question. I'm actually going to use whatever technique you guys recommend to negotiate for a card that I've been hunting. This card finally became available after a five-year search. So he goes, I missed out on the last couple of copies that sold, and I really need this one. But the buyer has it listed for three times its market value on eBay, and no offers are allowed. So please choose from the following options. And he gets five options here, A, B, C, D, and E. And whatever nice. we recommend, that's what he's going to do. Perfect. He says, A, should I hit bin? and sell some PC cards to fund it if necessary, but ultimately I'm paying the 3X upcharge regardless. B, should I use the I'm a huge collector sympathy technique to get the seller to shed a tear and then maybe they'll work a deal? C, should I tell the seller that they have it way overpriced and send screenshots of card ladder comps to make him feel like an idiot so that he gives me a big discount? <laughs> <laughs> I like the marketing opportunity of C so far. <laughs> D, uh, should I ask if he wants to trade? Just see if he wants to just do a trade with me. Or E, should I ask if he can get close to the recent comps? I'll show him what the recent comps are, and then maybe we can negotiate a markup from there. Mm, I have a strong opinion, not on one specific of those five, but of a strategy. Okay. The overall strategy is pick any of them but A, and A will be your backup if it starts to go awry. Yeah. So, so you're saying, like, let's not just give in at the outset. Yeah, A is, a is there. Option A is there. We can just bend this. If it's not, if he's taking two days to respond, or you can just tell, like, it's not going your way, just bend it. Do you have a strong preference of like, should you try the playing the I'm a big collector yeah. card? Should I try to beat him over the head with comps? I'd probably go for D because I feel like whenever you get in that space with somebody, like they will probably take on other cards. I don't know. Or you're just trying to like overvalue yours and they overvalue theirs and it turns into this like trade thing. I don't know, but that's, that's probably not going to go well either. I don't know. That is like a decent antidote to the guy overvaluing his card is then you just show up with a trade and overvalue your cards. Yeah. And then they like, <laughs> they even out. That's I've seen a few of these posts on social media where it's like, who won this trade? And it's like both sides were just overvaluing their cards significantly. Right. Uh, that's just like me being a smart ass too. Like I just, I just want to like win the argument. Like I don't even care about the card. I I want to win that argument of like you're wrong. Your card's overpriced, and mine is also overpriced, but it's equally overpriced to yours. Yeah, I I find that using comps should be in plenty of times is just like a, a reasonable thing. It's just like if you show the comps, the, the person's either gonna be like, yeah, I don't really want to go off of that. I just rather keep it or something. But sometimes when you show the comps and they don't want to go along with it, it just puts them in a weird position where, like, they know that you know that they're trying to overcharge you. And then there's, like, a guilt that permeates the discussion that makes it very awkward. Because it's, like, it's just, like, how can you not realize that, like, well, you, you know that I'm trying to overcharge you. I know that I'm overcharging you. So why am I selling the card? You know, I'm just, I'm trying to be greedy here. And like, when there's, when there's a mutual acknowledgement of the greed, it just gets a little awkward. So, so for, so for some people, not for all, 
Some people are completely, some people are like, yeah, I understand. You want to get the most you can, but for some people, like, it gets weird when I send the comp over and they're just like, oh, you know what I'm doing. <laughs> like, you see me, like, you, I, now I'm naked. I, you can, you know. Got down a mutual agreement of the greed. <laughs> what? Mutual agreement of what? Of the greed. You said that. <laughs> it sounds like a really cool book. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I'm leaning towards the trade one. Are you maybe going for like the softball message of gently showing them the comp? I like, yes, I, I like the trade option too. Now, now that you mention it, because I usually end up getting to that at some points in the discussion anyway. It's just like, oh, like, well, I'm not going to pay that much, but like, well, what do you think about this as a trade option? And if nothing else, it's, wears them down a little bit it's sort of like lets the negotiation go through some phases and there's always like there's always a magnetism of reaching an end point once you've like had a few failures in a negotiation there's like it just seems like there's a momentum starts to build up to wanting to reach a deal it's like you know we're not able to meet on price and i offer you some cards for trade, you don't want to do that either. Like all of a sudden there's a momentum starts building. Like, yeah, we're both trying to work towards getting to a middle place here. But I would not expect the trade to work. The, the risk of not doing A though, that I'm thinking, is if you run into the most annoying persona in the hobby, which is once they get any shred of interest in a card, they raise their price. Oh, and they just are like, oh. this, isn't that the most annoying person that's like oh i just messaged you about it now you're raising the price because you think that there's like a bidding war over your card like Dude, that the thinking feeling that happens when when like you were like you didn't want to hit the bin but you you wouldn't hate it if you did but then you start talking and like they get the sense that there's uh some they smell blood in the water and then yeah and all of a sudden the price goes up and like if you could just go back in time, you could have bought it for a thousand, but now it's fifteen hundred. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to know the ratio. He's, this question asker definitely doesn't have to tell me because this is way too personal. Might as well send me your social security number. The ratio of the card's value to like their total net worth. If it's like point oh oh one percent, just bid it. Yeah. But if it's like this is two months rent, all right. This is a legit question. We should figure this out. Yep. So, uh, what's our official recommendation in prison, Mike? Because <laughs> he's going to actually do it. Let's say, I'm gonna, I'll say D, unless you really feel strongly. Yeah. So, I like, the answer to this is complex. Start out with D. Start out with an attempt to trade. If that doesn't materialize, play all the other cards in the deck as well. You can try, I would, the next one I would go to is the sympathy technique. <laughs> If that doesn't work, then start beating them over the head with comps. <laughs> and then if that doesn't work, then just, you know, decide if you want to hit the bin. Yeah, I hate to laugh because this is a serious recommendation. I'm just laughing at the <laughs> be beating, beating them over the head is the fun one. Yeah, it's absurd, but it's fun. Okay. All right, from Basketball Card Collector 93, do you prefer serial numbers to be on the front or the back of the card? Hmm. Back. Yeah. I, did, I put this to a poll and 66% uh, voted back as well. It depends for me. Like, it depends if it's integrated into the design of the card. Like, they knew it was going to be serialized. So, like, they, wa they wanted it to be a, fo like a focus that adds something to the design. It's just like a stamp that just like sits awkwardly somewhere. Okay, valid point. I think I'm gonna split the baby this way. If it's a one of one, I want it on the front. Mm -hmm. If it's not, not a one of one, I want it on the back. Because I think like, like I, I first of all, I love the way certain one of one fonts look. I think they can look really nice. And if the card is a one of one. The fact that it's a one of one is such an important aspect of the card that it should be right out front and obvious. I think, otherwise, it's uh, it's still a really cool feature of the card, but it's it's totally fine if it's on the back. 
Yeah, that's a cool point. I do like the hollow foil on some. Like I have this one here with me randomly, but like the hollow foil of the see that serial print. Like it's kind of neat. Adds a little bit. Yep. Uh, the question asker. I asked what his opinion was. He said um, for refractor and shiny cards, he likes it on the back. And then to Christina's point for like patch autograph cards, RPAs, stuff like that, he like he thinks it looks better on the front. That's pretty much how it's done. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, exactly. It sure is. All right. From Cardi C Sports Cards. I wonder if Cardi C is loving these. Are these good NHL playoffs right now? Uh, I mean, the Stars are, but yeah. I haven't been watching anyone else. I don't care about anyone else. I only watch the Stars. Bill Simmons did a thing about how much he hates the opponent of the Bruins. He called that one guy the Antichrist. I was laughing <laughs> so much at that. Yeah. So, I don't know. That made me start thinking that, like, the NHL playoffs are, are, very, are enthralling right now. So, I hope he's enjoying them. I'm going to pull it up right now. I want to see the bracket. I couldn't tell you left from right. Bruins are playing the Panthers. Yep, Bruins are playing the Panthers. That, that is just words that you just said. <laughs> okay, here, Bill, here we go. Bill said nobody Boston knows. Boston is playing Florida. Does that make it better? Yeah. Christina has that game on right now. That Dude, they, the, the, they're in overtime. Well, they're in second overtime now. In first overtime, which is just another period of hockey. Mm-hmm. So, like... Now they're going into second. So, like, yeah, we got it. Okay. So, in first overtime, Marchment scored, but they're saying that Ducci was in, or Dutchie, whatever his name is, uh, is, was in the crease and like tampered with the goalie. But it is like they're replaying it over and over again now, and he wasn't. All right. We don't, but we don't need to play by play right now. What the hell is this shit? What is this? There's a one here and a one here. There's two one seeds in the West. Yeah, I don't know how that works. I think that's maybe the first seed each division, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, this is a closeout game on the road for the Dallas Stars. So it's here. it's uh, three, three, two stars. Yeah. Yep. And it's one one at the moment. Yeah. Oh wow. And now it's going this to is- shoot out. Yeah. No, there's no shootouts in, in uh, playoffs. They yeah. literally just keep playing periods of hockey until one team yeah. is so tired that they break down. Yeah, the Oilers. This is the team with that guy, right? It's McDavid. Yep. 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 McDavid. That's the. I see. As like a insanely casual fan, I would be rooting for that team. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yep. That's so boring, right? Yep. All right. Oh, good. Suck it, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Did they just get knocked out? They're out because he said on the pod, like, "Oh, they play Friday night." And I like looked up. I was like, "I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna look this up when I get back." And then I forgot. And here we are. <laughs> Good. The way he was hating was crazy. I've never heard him do that for the NBA or the NFL. Yeah, because he was like salty about how NHL fans treat him, so he just went in hot. I kind of liked it. <laughs> The guy has a mom. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Stiff wants to know, oh, how could it only be one-to-one? Nobody could score two? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not like football where they just give invisible points for the same amount, like, for the same goal. Christina's saying it's, it's no different than a seven-to-seven game. All right. Um, <laughs> Wow, look at all that. All that all that content for the hockey guys in here. Right. We, really, we really flexed our hockey muscle, didn't we? <laughs> that is an atrophied muscle. I root for a team because they have a guy that I'm aware of. <laughs> it's okay. I root for a team because we're across the street from where we're playing. <laughs> yep. That's, that's like how half of sports work. I, I live in the state. I'm rooting for the team, the yeah. local sports team. You're supposed to do it, yeah. Yeah. I don't think the Blackhawks are any good, so you guys are fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, Arizona just lost their hockey team to Utah. I'm so sad about that. <laughs> now I can't. Now I can't not go to the games ever again. <laughs> well, they have them playing at the college campus. Like I know. I I 
have season tickets to ASU football and that hockey arena that you're describing is like 500 feet away from where I tailgate. And I'm like, that's where they play. No shit. They want to leave that place. It's like, it literally looks like a kid's hockey rink. Like it's so small. It's like 2000 seats. It's a joke. Yeah. All right. Let's get to the final few questions here. This one's from Kevin M. Cormier. He says, are there characteristics of a card, such as the player, the year, or the set, that makes you extra cautious if you see a raw copy of the card in the year 2024? I sometimes see raw cards being sold online, and I assume that there's an issue with that card just because most of the similar cards have been graded. Yeah. The characteristic is value. <laughs> The more valuable the card, the more suspicious I am that it's not graded. Perfect. Completely agree. Total. Although it, miss. it does happen sometimes. Just like that Mahomes prison gold that just showed up on eBay and somebody said it was an orange. <laughs> what? That yeah. was real? Yeah, that was real. But Golden, uh, somebody at Golden got to the seller and convinced them to slab it with PSA and then sold it at auction for like a hundred and something grand. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that happens very rarely, but it's usually like when the seller doesn't, you know, it's like the seller account looks weird and they don't know what they're doing and you take the risk and you can get your money back. Those are the only times it happens. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, you nailed it. That's the main characteristic. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Let's, uh go on here we're gonna jesse do j pencher we're gonna it? do it i can sense this what we're gonna make it through before two hours yeah <clears throat> all right jesse j pender says if the nba top 75 was redone today who would be the two biggest jumps on the list and two of the biggest fallers on the list i don't know how, how in-depth we want to go into this right i got i got one faller and i got one jumper let's hear it all right, the jumper is Jokic. I think he actually – I don't remember what he has on that list, but he's probably he, like – He's or seven. He's not on the list. My brain just malfunctioned. How is <laughs> yeah, he not on the list? He, he's not on the top 75 list. Isn't Russell Westbrook on that list? Yeah. Westbrook. Carmelo Anthony is number 69. Westbrook is 68. Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis was 71. Damian Lillard was 75. Yeah, I mean, how was he not on the list? When was it? This was list was made last year, right? Uh, 2022 was when this list came out. But he had an MVP. He did. He did right. have an MVP when this list came out. Well, there's your answer, and it's not even debatable. Yep, that's a good answer. Uh, and you're going to love this one, the dropper. You want to guess? Scotty Pippen. No. Well, wow, that's pretty I'm good. Just joking, Go ahead. He, he's been annoying the, sh the living fuck out of me these whole playoffs, and he deserves to be dropped, even though he hasn't been playing. That's Reggie Miller. Reggie Miller, okay. He's been exposed through statistics. You know, like, I think he has, like, four all-stars. Like, he's just his stats aren't that great. Number 50. Reggie Miller. 51. He's number 51. 51. All those guys you just named have way better career accolades and he does. Dwight Howard should be on the top seventy five ahead of him. Yep. Yep. That's those are I I don't even want to follow that. I just think that's good. He said two. You can it doesn't you could those are like the you can't beat the Jokic one, so like I'm, I'm always in favor of uh knocking Scotty Pippen down as many picks as possible. <laughs> What's he out <laughs> Scotty Pippen? He is thirty second. Yeah, that's pretty high. One slot ahead of Kawhi Leonard. Yeah, doesn't Kawhi Leonard have two Finals MVP? He does. Yep. Scotty has zero. Scotty has zero. Mm -hmm. I I would rather have Kawhi than Scotty. Think about this. God, I could rattle off a bunch of other names, but like, if Michael Jordan didn't exist, Scotty Pippen wouldn't even be in the top five hundred list. You know, like Draymond Green, Clay. Thompson, some of these guys that are just like you guys wouldn't even be close to these lists. And Clay was all mad about this. I wasn't on the top seventy-five, dude. Come on, come on man. Yep. What do you think about eleven Shaquille O'Neal, ten Kobe Bryant? Oh, I always think Kobe 
he's way too high on these lists. I think he's more like 16 or 17. I think Larry Bird gets a little bit of a raw deal in number seven behind uh, Bill Russell, Wilt, Magic, Kareem, LeBron, and Jordan. I like it better when him and Magic are neck and neck. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't don't really have any big bones to pick with this list. Yeah, because Magic and Kareem. (laughs) Yeah. He's pretty. Yep. I think Anthony Edwards could be on this list. Maybe number 76. I don't understand how you could put Shaq. Nice try. I'm going to not take that bait. No, you're joking. I know he's joking. I, I saw Publius. That was for Publius. I just don't get how you can put Shaq behind Kobe when they played together and Shaq won all the finals MVPs. All three? And one, one of them, someone posted the stats, like Shaq's numbers are like insanely better. I forget which finals. Yeah, so Shaq has three finals MVPs, Kobe has two, and they each have one regular season MVP. Yeah. It's not gonna matter though soon because Jokic is gonna be above Shaq and then <laughs> and Shaq will be off TNT, so I won't have to listen to a mumble anymore. You would just cast the ultimate jinx. So take that back. I don't I believe in jinxes. I believe in manifestation. Alright. <laughs> I believe in abundance. Two thousand one finals. Uh Shaq averaged 33 points, 16 rebounds, 5 assists, and 3.5 blocks. Is that good? <laughs> That's pretty good, yeah. Okay. And Kobe averaged 24.5, 8 rebounds, 6 assists, 1 steal, 1 block. And the percentages were Kobe shot 41%. Which is quite good as well. I'm not going to take anything away from that. But it's just like clearly Shaq was the better player. And, you know, Kobe was younger. Shaq was in his prime. I get it. That was their second. And then the next year, in 2002 finals, Shaq averaged 36, 12, 4, and 3 blocks. Kobe averaged 27, and 6, and 5. That's really impressive, especially because, like, they could just start fouling Shaq. He shot 51% from the free throw line <laughs> in that last one, and then 66. So, yeah, he's shooting. He's averaging these crazy. Crazy points with the poor free throw percentage. Yeah. Think if he shot good free throws. Yep. All right. Uh, next question here, also from Jesse J. Pender. Do either of you wear or collect LeBron or Jokic shoes? Not game worn, but just the regular release shoes. Nope. No. Same answer here. I have Lucas. You do have Lucas, yeah. And I would like uh, a pair of the uh, Jokic Spongebob. <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't say you collect them. You just you no, buy them and you wear them. or wear them. Oh, he did, he sorry. Say or wear them. Sorry. Yeah. The I, Luca ones are very comfortable. Yeah, okay. I'm thinking about collecting these, though. <laughs> I, I got my first pair of Luca ones as a Christmas present from someone. Yes, he did. Show the grass stain. I can't get it. <laughs> there we go. I'll tell you how it was on the Bucks because they got the red field. There we go. That's called that's photo matching right there. That is called diseases. <laughs> Do people All right. know what, the, what diseases can be passed through a foot? That's like the grossest part of a body. Yeah, and uh, all right. I have a pair of Maxi Kleba game worms that were gifted to me. Yes, you do. Yeah, I'm gifts. Christina wants her dinner. She gets a lot of gifts. It's better than a jock strap, right? Dress. What's that? I'd rather have shoes than a jock strap. I take it back. It's closer than you might think. Okay, but think about it. the shoes. They take out the like the inserts on the shoes too because they keep those. So like, spray a little bit of Febreze and then put that in a display case, and you never have to think about it again. Yeah. And. We were talking about gambling earlier. That's a, that's taking a gamble right there. <laughs> the jockstrap one, I'll never get over that. I can't believe you would buy something that's touched the dudes. They fractionalized it. Oh, my gosh. It was Andre the Giant, like literally the grossest human being, the biggest guy, like the sweaty 
funniest guy. Oh my god. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, Grace, this this question is a trap and it's bait. Oh, I love bait. From Mick Wildcats. Sadly, Marshall Fogel cannot live forever. <laughs> yeah. So who will be the next quote unquote face of the hobby? And then three options are given. Gary V, G off W, or Darren R. Well, here's the type of content you get from Darren R. <laughs> Okay. Is there an other option? Can you just say what you're showing right now for the audio listeners later? Darren Ravel tweeted out a picture of Andre the Giant's jockstrap. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a hammock for most of us. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Did you watch the Tom Brady roast yet? That was like roast level quality right there. I made it through 30-ish minutes of it. Um, I, I, I listened, I thought, uh, Drew Bledsoe did a nice job. Yeah. I can't be, I would, I wouldn't be able to do what he, I mean, he went up there and did a nice job. I thought, I think, uh, well, first of all, I think people are writing those jokes for them and they have it on a teleprompter. So you could do it. Okay. That's a good point. But, uh, yeah, yeah. They, I saw, and I saw the Roastmaster guy, the Jeff Ross, do his part, and then uh, Nikki Glazer came up, and then I that was around the time I called it quits. What was that one joke I sent you? Uh, you, you might not have got to it yet, and I forget already, but... No, I remember. I, I, you, I definitely... If you said what it was... I, yeah, I, don't, I, I don't remember. I wish I did. But Nikki Glazer was like, Jeff Ross, are you pickled? Like... <laughs> <laughs> They said every time they see him, he just looks sicker and sicker. Uh, I was going to say something about the Bledsoe tongue thing, but I wasn't sure. But so stiff in the chat says that his, I just like couldn't help but notice. He kept like licking his lips. <laughs> I, was just kidding. I didn't notice it, but like I just had it on. Like I was on my phone. So. It's pretty like dark, right? Didn't you think it was like overly dark? Yeah, a little bit. I love when they like, make, make fun of Gronk and he just is not able to go along with it. He doesn't even know what they're talking about. <laughs> Gronk was just thing. getting so many strays and like everybody around him has processed the joke and laughing and he's just like <laughs> he's just not he doesn't know how to he doesn't know how to just like laugh it off, you know. But you haven't gotten to the Gronk part yet? Where he no. gets the speed? Oh. Well, I don't know if you really go back, back to it or not. To be completely honest, it's uh, it's a lot. It's like three hours long. So yeah, it is. All right, okay. Uh, real quick answer to the bait question: There is no face of the hobby. Uh, the hobby isn't you know one guy speaking to a big audience. The hobby is a the ho- the and the hobby isn't like a few people playing a sport in front of a bunch of spectators. There are very few spectators in the hobby. There are very few people in the hobby who are like, I just want to watch people buy, sell, and trade cards and build collections. That's not how it works. Everybody in the hobby is a participant. They are the athlete. They are the person in the, in the arena, so to speak, in their own minds. They, everybody in the hobby is the main character in their own game. So we're never going to see a face of the hobby type of thing. That's just not how this community, that's not how this, system works this is a system of a bunch of main characters everybody's the main character in their own hobby experience so everybody is the face of their own hobby what a liberal <laughs> yeah. we're perfectly uh, equal so should i stop voting for you for influencer of the year well that's my gambit actually is that the person who least wants to be president should be president <laughs> <laughs> or the person who least wants to be the influencer of the year deserves it. That makes sense. Yep. So that, that's actually my and that's that's my uh, end game there. Thanks. All right. From South Park Cards, if the molesters are ethical, why have they kept a low media presence? 
And by molesters, I think he means people who are uh, putting chemicals and stuff on molesting cars. <laughs> so I think the question stands on its own. Now I know we're getting to the end of the question. <laughs> I think I just think that question speaks for itself. All right. Mike Pinkerton 50 would like to know how will Golden going to eBay change them? Mm. Probably, it probably won't change them much. Yep, tend to agree with that. They have a banner though on the eBay site. That's getting that makes me kind of really excited about that. Yep, that's that's big. All right, from Drake PC, would it be irresponsible of me to wager my kids' college fund? Oh wow, look at that! Look at the beautiful banner. Would it be uh, irresponsible of me to wager my kid's college fund on the Nuggets' money line in Game 7? I don't know. Did you watch Game 6 where they lost by 45? <laughs> Wait, are these series uh, are these series done by the who wins more games, or is it a total plus minus? <laughs> whole, I think that one's wrapped up. Yep. That, it better not be total <laughs> points. <laughs> is this like the in-season tournament? I think the Nuggets are screwed. They're like minus. 80. Yep, I hope it's not working out that way. No, no. All right, six. Never win. I told you I'd bet a thousand bucks on it. I didn't because I'm a pussy, but. Ah, the odds were good at one point. What is it? It's probably even money, right? No, they got to be favored, man. Yeah, no, they're big favorites. Yeah, exactly. Game seven at home. Yeah, they're like minus 192, yep. I think. Can we talk about, though, how the media does this thing where they're like, oh, the, the home, like the team. And I just like wanted it more and they hustled more and they hit the loose balls more and it's like or they just like hit more threes and some of the loose balls just like went their way. They act like this like magic formula to like trying harder in the game. All these guys are trying their hardest. Yeah, exactly. And the, the, the Nuggets just didn't want it, you know, they weren't trying. <laughs> yeah, they just they didn't want it enough. And like the Pacers Nick series, that's all the discussion. Like, oh, the Knicks wanted it more in game five. And then they got to game six and they were like, you know what? <laughs> We don't want it anymore. <laughs> I don't think so. Like, like I, I just think I think tonight we should we should take it easy, guys. That's pretty funny. All right, uh, uh, three questions left from six twelve gems. Please discuss how Anthony Edwards is going to send home Jokic after he did to the Suns. <laughs> mm, spell check. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, spoken like a true Anthony Edwards fan. <laughs> oh, We're in that, that roast mindset right now. That's good. Yep, moving on. <laughs> All right, from Chrissy Buckets. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if he totally intended this question to be read, and I'm I'm taking a risk by reading it, but I think it's a topic that actually is on a lot of people's minds. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. From Chrissy Bucket, please discuss the $30,000 Anthony Edwards Prism Black sale. Nat Turner was the last person I expected to buy that car. So let me see if I can pull up a picture of this card. I believe Nat posted it during the demolition of the Nuggets. It's a third year Prison Black one of one PSA 10 of Anthony Edwards. This is a really nice looking. I really like how the Prison Black from that year looks in particular. It's just a nice looking card. And, and uh, but yeah, I mean, there were some questions like here, somebody in the comments says, I'm not used to seeing you buy prospects or anything outside of 90s players and LeBron. And Nat just came back and said, I know, I know. <laughs> He's like, I know, I know. The double I know is like, He's questioning it himself a bit. <laughs> so I don't know what I. I think it's fantastic to uh, see Nat buying an active player or two every now and again. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. But it's I mean it's a one of one. You know, what's he gonna do? Buy it later when it decreases in value after Anthony Market's market comes back down? <laughs> or you know, it's like this is it. This, this is it. All right, and then uh, last question from Rick Kinnick 3. Please discuss the game used versus game issued controversy and sticker autograph authenticity. <laughs> big topics. 
first of all, what is what is the game use versus game issued controversy? Do you know what he's referring to? You mean no. game more like game like the 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 baseball cards in the baseball players' pockets during games? I don't think so. What is game issued? I think game issued means it's a jersey that was supplied maybe to the player but they didn't actually wear it in the course of the game. Maybe it was a warm up, or maybe it was an alternate jersey or something. I think, I don't know, I'm just, I'm not. Yeah, I don't understand the question. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Do you know, do you have anything to add to this? Well, it's probably just like the photo shoot type stuff, like you said. Yeah. Like a generically, what is the, what's the, the argument on the two sides and the controversy? Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I guess like, there's some concern maybe that like there's actually a big difference between game used versus game issued but not used. And maybe you know, people want it to be really clear on the back side of the cards which is which. Right. And then sticker auto authenticity. I mean, yeah. Dude, you can just sticker. rip them off and put them on different cards now. Sticker autos yeah. are better. You can they're more portable. Okay, turp enforcement says it refers to a real jersey being issued for the player who's just never worn. <laughs> just, just rip that sticker auto off and put it on a better car. Yes, yeah, so it's more portable yeah. now. It's better. Definitely. Is. All right, we did it. We made it through all of them. I don't remember the last time we, we did that, so that's great. Say this, say this stupid line that people always say in business meetings. I'm going to give you guys eight minutes of your time back. <laughs> I'm going to give you guys some time back tonight. We can circle back to this later, make sure we're aligned. For all you people that are up at 1.52 in the morning. <laughs> uh, but we're not actually going to give time back yet because we need to pick a title. Oh, damn it. We just no title this, this episode and then give everyone time back. <laughs> Call that title, giving everyone time back? We're giving you eight minutes back? Rip through them. All right. Went through the vortex of Flipper Nation. <laughs> it's so fucking epic sounding. <laughs> Went through the vortex of Flipper Nation. All right. Stuff a relic inside it. <laughs> Let's start cutting squares and cards. <laughs> it's been bastard. Ruined and destroyed, like everything else in this hobby. <laughs> That's the ultimate curmudgeon line. Yeah. Uh, we shamed it so much, people got afraid. <laughs> A lot of the sentences that I say aren't like correct sentences, but you, you know what I mean. I know what you mean. Nick is all over those. Whenever I just like make up words as I go, he's all over it. <laughs> I should have told you nothing. <laughs> That's just like a really good caption for anything. <laughs> I don't know what it's referring to. <laughs> then you gotta do the like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. That uh, no, okay. All right. My eyes are wasting time. <laughs> See, like that. When you're looking at the yeah. That doesn't make any sense, but. <laughs> Oh, it means like when you're looking through the the vaults and it's all overpriced. Yeah, but like, I, whatever. <laughs> uh, if I collect a Moses staff, that's a relic. <laughs> <laughs> I can think of like the oldest thing you could collect. <laughs> what like predates everything, <laughs> Moses? <laughs> I should have done like, uh, like Adam's apple, you know. <laughs> Adam's apple. That, that, that's a relic. Yeah. Uh, uh, shorten this and make them ugly. <laughs> shorten this and make them ugly. <laughs> the autos, I think. All, all right. Mutual agreement of the greed. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a really awesome book about like the shadiness going down on Wall Street. Like, you could just... It would be like a New York bestseller just because of the title. Yeah, it'd be like a Aaron Sorkin script or something. Okay. Uh, we flexed our hockey muscle. <laughs> <laughs> we 
we did. Um, cast the ultimate jinx, which is what you did. Grossest part of the body. <laughs> <laughs> I still have it. This is, this is still on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> Around. What, what's on your screen? He's yeah. showing the giant jock strap. Nick in the comments said that guy's not wearing gloves. That's <laughs> 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 so funny. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one is just the grossest human being. <laughs> this is why we read the captions like. It's the funniest part of the show because there's just no context. You can read them one oh, by one. <laughs> it's good to go out on a light note. <clears throat> All right. Well, what are we picking? Well, I think we got like six or seven good ones, but I really, I really, I really like. I should have I should have told you one. nothing with the uh, emoji. Yeah, people are just like gonna click on the video for that alone. They're like, what me have said, and then they listen to the whole thing and they're like, uh, nothing didn't even make sense. Yep. Uh, good. Uh, there's other good ones, though. There's other good ones. No, yeah. There's plenty of good ones, but I like that one, too. I think that's just easy. I think people I think people try to guess which one we're going to pick as they listen to us go through them. But I think we keep them on there. So I don't think... I think it's hard to predict what one we're going to do. Because we try to make them topical sometimes. Yeah. Like, we could do something about the sticker auto or something. Something like that, but that's it boring. Is. All right, good. Got a title, good show. I'm gonna give you guys three minutes to that. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys next week. DY Card Ladder is the most respected sports card analytics app on the market. We have virtually every card in our system. If the card you are looking for ever sold on one of these platforms, you can find it using Card Ladder's sales history. Easily find recent comps and get a better estimate what your cards are worth. See why Card Ladder is the most trusted and the most reliable sports card analytics app on the market. We know what you want because Card Ladder was created by collectors for collectors. Join the innovators, not the imitators. Card Ladder, constantly innovating. Try it for free. See why Card Ladder is the industry leader in sports card data. Hard Ladder. We're just getting started.